The Imagine Belfast Festival of Ideas and Politics had a sold out event which would have seen Sam McBride uh, in conversation with William Crawley at Ulster University and then they put on a second evening and it sold out as well. But coronavirus has put paid to a festival audience so I'm Alan Mabon, I'm sitting in for William and I'm here talking to Sam McBride uh, in the room in which he probably wrote, burned his famous book, and bringing him to you, the online festival audience. Um, welcome, Sam. If it's not Thanks slightly, very much. slightly odd to welcome you to your own <laughs> to your own home. You're very welcome. <laughs> but I mean, two sold out nights at um, Imagine, four print runs of a book, numerous book signings and talks. Um, are you ever kind of surprised at how the public imagination was just grabbed by RHI of all the many scandals and interesting things in politics that we've had? Yes, in simple terms. Um, I, I still can't quite believe it. Um, I mean, you, you can rationalise it in certain ways as to this story. There was an absurd element to this. There was an element of um, anger from the public, a big element of anger. It was also both a very complicated story, but it was simplified in that way. One point in, one sixty out, the minister was warned, um, the civil servants in her department were warned, nothing was done, and then the allegations of corruption, which obviously have been ruled on by Sir Patrick Coughlin. And so therefore, there's a certain logic to that, but there are so many scandals that are probably um, objectively bigger, more important, bigger sums, maybe over a longer period of time or whatever, um, more specific um, uh, allegations around individuals, and yet they don't catch the public um, uh, imagination like this. And so therefore, um, there is a certain element of this which you can rationalise and there's a certain element of it that even looking back doesn't quite make sense but there is no story that I've written about which comes close to this in terms of just the public interest in it and to have something that is both in the public interest and the public are interested in is, is pretty unusual. And do you think people were picking up on the amount of money and the kind of the, the huge kind of sums or the was it the kind of incompetence or um, what seemed for a while to be the potential, the, the allegation of some kind of impropriety, um, kind of leaking of information and sharing of stuff that was inappropriate? You know, what, what were the things that people, or was it just the fact that all those came together that made this uh, a, you know, an, an uber story that really caught the attention? Well, it changed over time. Um, the, the point where this really became a massive scandal was BBC Spotlight, 6th of December 2016. I remember it sitting down in the living room as a regular member of the public as well as as a journalist watching it getting angry Connor, um, Connor S. Backman it was, um, tossing um, banknotes, £20 banknotes into the campfire at Crawfordsburn, um, as we now know, um, and they were going up in smoke and he just told how the money had been wasted. And money had been wasted and he kept doing this. And it was such a gripping and graphic way of telling the story. And that got people angry. At that point, it was just about the whistleblower had come and she hadn't been listened to. We didn't really know what had gone on. Um, then, obviously, just over a week later, Jonathan Bell does this big interview with Nolan. That moves it into different territory. Then there's allegations of corruption essentially I mean I, I don't think he actually used that word but that was essentially what he was saying he was stopped from closing the scheme he said and um, by the DUP improperly so and he was alleging that there was undue influence there and so therefore the public had been massively interested in it after BBC Spotlight then once you um, turbocharge that I suppose with the allegation of corruption it just took it to a different level and from then on it was just one thing after another and it was really appallingly handled from the point of view of the DUP the executive I've talked to some of those people and they now look back and say more or less how on earth did we get into this situation and there's quite a lot of um, I think honest um, at least private um, retrospection there as to um, what actually happened. And I suppose um, I don't want to go over the whole story because in a, in a sense we're nearly today we're kind of thinking about the end of it and thinking about the inquiry and things but what was, what was the moment when it was kind of sparked your imagination because as a journalist you see 20-30 uh, press releases a day coming from all kinds of strange organisations and government departments you see all kinds of things that are kind of make you go could be something in that or I could look into that but what kind of made this first jump out and then stay as a story that has endured kind of your, your this section of your career is very defined by it for the last three or four years but well it was it was it was two points really so the, the first point was when Jonathan Bell put out a press release in um, February 2016 saying we're shutting the scheme and um, he mentioned an, an overspend he said it's going to be done very urgently and what caught my eye wasn't any of that it was the fact that it came out late on a Friday evening and um, anybody who knows anything about Stormont knows that's a classic slot in which to bury bad news the fact that there was even an executive press officer working at that point in his department is very unusual you phone after five o'clock on a Friday evening on a landline in Stormont you'll struggle 
difficult to get anybody. And so therefore it was clear to me they, they, they do not want to get much coverage of this story. So I was instantly suspicious. I made a freedom of information request, went nowhere. Mr. Bell, who later that year would say, I'm spilling everything, I'm telling the truth. God told me to tell the truth. My wife told me to tell the truth. Um, even Ian Paisley, who was dead by that stage, told me to tell the truth one time. Um, at that point, he had the chance to open the files and what had happened, and he chose to say, no, we're not releasing anything. So I, I largely forgot about it. Various things happened over the summer. Brexit happened, and none of this happens in a vacuum. We are operating um, with all sorts of stories going on, and um, there's an element of competition in um, news terms as to which takes precedence at any one point. And it was really then Conor McCauley's spotlight, uh, or Conor um, Spackman's um, spotlight for the BBC um, that December, which really genuinely got me angry, um, both as a journalist who, who, who has worked with some of these people, who knows a bit of the system, but also just as a member of the public. Um, I was angry and he, he, he was making very explicit how much money was involved. Here at that point we were talking something like £500 million, which was the overspend from Stormont's budget. Um, actually the total bill to taxpayers was way over a billion pounds, but I think it's quite telling that the only bit that people in Stormont and bluntly I think a lot of the public ever really seemed to get exercised about was the bit that was coming out of Stormont's budget, the bit that was going to um, come out of schools and hospitals budgets. That got people angry. The fact that taxpayers' money from the rest of the UK was being wasted I don't think got very many people angry at any mm -hmm. point in this story, which is a separate issue, um, but that, that really got through to people. This matters. This is not some um, arcane government scheme that's boring and there's been a bit of a cock up and you know what, um, these things happen in government. This was getting through to the person in the street. This matters and you're going to suffer as a result of this. For better or worse, you've become synonymous with the story. Um, Connor Spackman gets the credit in a sense for bringing it to the greatest number of people's attention at the beginning. But um, you're, I mean, many journalists have covered it, but you're one of the, the longest enduring ones. Kind of the Nolan show in many ways on the radio kept it going morning after morning as well for a while. But I mean, has it been a comfortable journey kind of becoming one of those names that is just branded with RHI? Is that, as a journalist, is that. It's, it's not it's, really, really what you're trained for, is it? It's odd. I mean, it's you know, it's surreal because um, you know there was there was no point at which I um, you know started writing about this and thought I'll write a book about this in mm -hmm. three years' time or I'll keep writing about this for two or three years or any of that. Um, lots of what we do as journalists is sort of stumbling along in the dark. Um, with a little bit of the light and um, getting a little bit more as we go along and um, you, you, you never really know where you're going to end up quite often and so it was really just day to day um, breaking little bits of the story other journalists were breaking lots of this Nolan was doing lots and um, the Irish News were doing lots and um, uh, Connor McCauley from the BBC sat through all the the, the uh, RHI inquiry hearings um, and so the, there was there was lots going on mm -hmm. but um, I think from from the outset and um, we were able I suppose at the newsletter to um, first of all my, my my editor was outstanding. He gave me huge time to do this. Basically, just let me do this full time for um, certainly weeks at the outset of this. Um, at a point, thank, thank goodness we had no uh, assembly and executive up and running. Well, or, um, that, after the first kind of six or seven months. Although, of, um, uh, in, in, in news terms, I think it would be difficult to um, to uh, say that the public had, had that level of interest <laughs> um, in what was happening in the in the executive in the normal times in in in. in in Stormont at that point. But I think for, from that period forward, I suppose, we were able to sort of establish the newsletter that this was the place that was reporting the story the most at mm -hmm. that point, in print at least. And the Irish News had done something similar with the NAMA scandal a few months earlier. They had really got in there at the start, given lots of resources to it. And then what you find is that people then come to you with more information. Mm -hmm. And so there's this spiral effect where the more that you report, the more people come to you. And I had never seen anything like it. So it wasn't just sort of people in politics and um, the odd civil servant, people that I might have known that were coming to me. There were boiler installers, there were boiler owners, there were people who thought their neighbour was doing something crooked, there were um, people in the DUP, there were all sorts of people coming out of the woodwork and saying, we're angry about this too and let me tell you about this. And so that, that became a very powerful thing and it really became, I suppose, self-feeding almost. Um, and we were able to, um, to do lots there and I suppose got a lot of the credit. Lots of other people were doing lots of other stuff. Um, but a lot of this, I suppose, is about how people perceive something. And if yeah. they perceive that the Nolan Show and the newsletter, or whatever it might be, are doing lots in this story, that seems to be the natural place, I suppose, to come to somewhere. And also, it's a very complicated story. So I've tried to simplify this the whole way through. Um, and I think Stephen Nolan did a very good job, as did Spotlight at the start, about trying to simplify it for the person in the history. Street, um, and even for people like me who are journalists, just to try to understand what is actually at the crux of this. But I think that, that, that is, the, 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 the complexity of this story means that if you've reported it for three, four, five weeks, then for six months, you have a certain understanding of the significance of this new piece of information that might be lost in you if you hadn't had that background. And so therefore, the longer it goes on, the harder it is, I think, for somebody to come into it fresh 
and um, just pick up um, the uh, ball from, from where it's been left off. Um, you didn't grow up and become a poultry farmer or um, a civil servant. You ended up in journalism. How did that happen? What, what was the route into journalism for you? Well, I, I didn't grow up to be a poultry farmer, but my dad was a farmer. He was a dairy farmer. Um, he, he's retired now. He was, a, he was a very small dairy farmer. Um, so I, I, uh, I was the first person in my family to go to university. Um, I did English literature simply because I enjoyed reading and I enjoyed writing. Um, and like um, lots of other people, I suppose, I stumbled into journalism. Journalism is one of these um, great trades where people... Um, go into it from all sorts of backgrounds. There are people who have been lawyers, there are people who have been in all sorts of walks of life and they sort of stumble into it either because they have found that they couldn't um, make a living in, in, in the field that they had initially thought or just because they suddenly find it and realise it's a very interesting way to um, to make a living. So um, I, I, I started it because I like writing and um, it really grips you and you, you really get grabbed by it. The RHI report came out on Friday the 13th of March. It turned out maybe not to be as unlucky as some people felt that day. A lot of people were disappointed, I think, with the final report. It was less newsworthy or less scathing, they felt, than some of the kind of inquiry hearings and some of those interviews. Were you surprised that it took kind of the tone, that Sir Patrick took the tone that he did, having had such a quite a robustious and quite a challenging kind of inquiry style? I was very surprised um, and I, I don't know anyone who wasn't surprised. In fact, that's that's not quite true. I was talking to one person who said that as a lawyer, apparently Sir Patrick Coughlin was known as someone, um, or sorry, as a, as a judge then after having been a lawyer, Sir, um, Sir Patrick Coughlin was known as someone who could be incredibly robust in court in the courtroom with witnesses, but then his judgment w would be much more restrained um, than perhaps they might have thought. They might have thought, goodness, we're in incredible trouble here. And then actually they find that it's a more cautiously worded judgment. but. That's the only person I've spoken to who expressed that view. Everyone else who has followed this closely, from whatever view, people in the DUP, people in the civil service, people in journalism, people in um, who are boiler owners, all sorts of people with all sorts of views on this and interests in this have all been genuinely surprised. I think it was the, the level of restraint and the fact that there wasn't the same sort of plain speaking, the same sort of bluntness that we got. And I think that the public really liked from Sir Patrick Coughlin and from Diamuna O'Brien and from Dr. Keith McLean. They were a really impressive team at the inquiry hearings. Um, you had this mix of experience. You had a judge who's used to hearing evidence and discerning who's telling the truth and cutting through some of the legal elements of this. You've got somebody who's worked at the top of the civil service in Whitehall, in Diamuna, and in Dr. McLean, you have somebody who really understands the industry, boilers, um, kilowatt hours, he's doing mathematical calculations, he's um, really getting to the heart of some of the detail of this and it was a very, very impressive lineup. And yet when you read that report, if you hadn't seen those hearings, you would think this is very um, tame actually. Um, it's written in the language of the civil service, it's written in language which actually, I suppose, to the person in the street disguises how scathing it actually is. If you're a civil servant and you hadn't seen the hearings and it had all been behind closed doors and you were handed that report, I think it's devastating because of some of the detail of what went on and what he says about that. But it's very carefully written and it is not the sort of um, forthright um, commentary that we got from him and the sort of audible and visible exasperation that you got yes. from him as a judge listening to this or as a retired judge, as the chairman listening to this, there's n almost nothing in it that comes close to that. And lots of people are disappointed by that. Um, yes, because in some ways the theatre of it, um, the, the script was, wasn't anywhere near as good as the actual uh, and performance. Yet, <laughs> and yet it's, be, it's been a remarkable public service to Northern Ireland. I mean, I think the report will not be remembered, or sorry, the inquiry will not be remembered for its report. It will be remembered for its hearings. Um, those were televised, people got to see the evidence. Mm -hmm. That was a real strength of this process. And so you will get people who will use words like whitewash. They'll say people have been let off the hook. That's not for me to get into as a, as, a, as a journalist. But I think the real strength of this was that the public got to see the evidence and they're able to form their own conclusions, um, which are not as strong, which, which, which will not be taking on board all of the evidence that has been heard. Of course not. But they'll get to have a sense of what these people actually got up to and what they think of it. And that's very important, I think. I, mean, I, I took a flick through some of the kind of conclusions towards the end and then the recommendations, but I mean, this was a project too far for the Northern Ireland government. I mean, that, it's a very bland sentence, but it basically says you, you just weren't at all ready it's to do something of this it? size, you know, yep. and yet you had two or three people working on it. Um, no one had picked up on the fact that the tariff created a perverse incentive to produce excess heat. Um, the Deddy Minister and her SPAD had a division of responsibility for reading, analysing, digesting documents that was ineffective and led to false reassurance. You know, it, it's a even the Assembly Committee, uh, which is kind of told that well, it wouldn't be expected to pick up everything, but it really hadn't done enough scrutiny. Um, 
yeah, I mean, people, lots of people outside Derry said there's something wrong with this and nobody really seemed to listen to them and act on it. In a sense, it is damning, but it just doesn't read that way. Do you think some of this will get... I mean, coronavirus, um, those very same civil servants are working night and day, um, like Trojans, trying to actually make sure um, we have a health service and an education service and infrastructure and an economy and things to kind of to come back to. Um, and we're kind of very thankful for that. But is there a sense that um, some of the impetus to change... Um, you know, the minister has said that we, all, all the recommendations will be enacted, but actually it could be a long time before we see some of those changes. And actually some of them could be really important now that actually as decisions are being made or people are being brought into things that there is kind of enough accountability and enough scrutiny on decisions. I think inevitably coronavirus is going to dominate um, politics rightly for the next few months at the very least. And hopefully it's just for a few months, but it could be much more than that. Um, and so therefore, I think no matter how important any of these other things are, they will understandably have to take, um, have to ha have to be in second place to that. Um, but I think that, yes, I was looking at a meeting um, last week. There was a photo which the executive um, press office put out of a meeting of the um, civil contingencies um, uh, um, Emergency Committee, I think it's called, um, which basically coordinates all of the emergency services in Northern Ireland, senior civil servants, government ministers, the chief medical officer, all of the key people who are involved in this and who um, are doing their best to try to um, tackle this, this um, massive pandemic. And I could see on one side of the table four people who were associated with the RHI scandal in various ways. I couldn't see who was on the other side of the table. So on one side of the table, you've got four people who have um, some role in this, in this story and in this scandal. And I think that necessarily is a is a is a problem in terms of public confidence in in some of these institutions at a point when we need to trust our government the greatest public confidence instalment as an institution not just in terms of the politicians but critically in terms of the civil service the entire machinery of government is at pretty much an all-time low i think and so therefore people who might have prior to this thought well if if the ministers butt out of this and the civil servants are allowed to get on with it that will be better suddenly that is that is completely um, exposed to be a flawed way of approaching this. You have significant difficulties both among ministers and within the civil service. Um, and I think that hopefully, talking to some people in Stormont, they say that in a crisis, people break down some of the silos between departments. They break down some of the politics of this, although that hasn't been the case throughout this crisis. Um, but hopefully that is, as this goes on, something which um, means that we don't have these problems. But I think that if anybody thinks that suddenly RHI and the issues raised by it don't matter, they are of the profoundest significance because we need to have a government that is not just competent, but that we can believe is competent mm -hmm. because when they tell us to do something radical as they're doing now, we need to be able to believe them. And I think the difficulty here is that you will always have a, have a certain proportion of the population who will not believe their government for whatever reason, some of them absurd reasons. But here suddenly you've got a situation where quite rational people might question what they're being told. I don't think they should question it and I'm not questioning it and I'm doing what, what I'm being told. But I think it's very important that people realise the seriousness and the gravity of what's involved here. This is not unimportant. This is absolutely foundational in a society to be able to trust that these people um, know what they're doing and we can believe that, that what they tell us is right. Um, in many ways, when you wrote the book, you expected, I think, originally that it would probably come out maybe about a month after um, Patrick Cockburn's report <laughs> at best. Um, and, uh, and you've always said it's, it, you, weren't, you weren't running an inquiry, you were kind of, kind of writing a narrative and looking at other things. Some of the stuff you talk about isn't part of the inquiry, there, there's kind of evidence there and things that people have given you. But do you still have many unanswered questions? I mean, is RHI still kind of in the back of your head at night? You kind of wake up in the middle of the night and go, yeah, we still don't really understand that. Or, I mean, even just making that recommendation, there's an, an avalanche of things we've never really found out or papers we didn't find or texts that didn't come out or whistleblowers who haven't come forward, you know, um, are, are you left with lots of doubts and there's a kind of a, it's a continuing story? Yes, and I think one, <laughs> of the, one of the elements of this story which is most compelling is that we will never know the full story. The secrecy involved, the fact that things deliberately were not written down mean that um, there, there will never be a situation where we're able to have, even after a £14 million public inquiry, um, after three years of pouring through the documents, over a million pages of evidence compelling anybody that they wanted to compel, all of that material, even after that, we're not in a position to say, actually, we've got all the material. It's clear that the inquiry thought they weren't being given everything by everyone when they approached them first. And so therefore, um, they were suspicious about some of these people. They were saying, why is it that so-and-so has given us text messages 
and you're at the other end of some of these text messages and you haven't given us all of this. And then we're told from Timothy Johnston, the very powerful DUP former special advisor, that he had this system where his phone automatically deleted text messages after 30 days. Um, so naturally, therefore, we will never have what was from his phone in the key periods here. And so I think there is a there is a compelling element to that that for all that we know, and we know an awful lot more than we did at the outset, there is always this 30% maybe that we will never know. And one of the disappointing elements of Sir Patrick's report, I think, as opposed to his inquiry, is that a lot of the questions that actually we thought were more clearly answered, if you like, from some of the evidence to the inquiry, it seemed self-evident what had happened yeah. in several of these areas. When you read the report, it's much less evident. He doesn't decisively say, it seems pretty clear that this is what happened. So when it comes to something like the cutting out of the cost controls, this 107 words that are chopped out of the, the, uh, the Northern Ireland legislation that were in the GB um, legislation, there is no clear answer. I've read through that section of the report. Um, I, I, I've gone through the uh, recommendations several times. It's not really clear to me. It's, it's, a, it's a narrative of incompetence, of so-and-so mm -hmm. didn't do this and they should have done that. But you don't get to the end of it and think, well, actually, um, this is what actually happened. And yet that is a critical question, um, not just in terms of who did that, but in terms of what their motive might have been because of what comes down the line after that. And so, yes, I think there's a huge element of this story. We don't know now, and we might know some of it at some future point if some people break ranks and come forward and actually say, well, I didn't tell the inquiry this, but wait till you hear this. But there's elements of it we will never know. Would you love a very long lunch with Sir Patrick Coughlin to have, to chat about it? Because I mean, in a sense, it's um, you must be dead curious as to kind of why why he took the approach he did. Why um, even during the inquiry, he took some of the approaches that he did. He I mean, he gave people a hard time. He was um, he was kind of like a headmaster who didn't trust what he was being told, which I suppose is exactly what he was to do. But I mean, would you would you love to kind of tease that stuff out over a couple of hours? Absolutely. Um, I I'm, I'm, I'm a <laughs> there's the offer enough, there. Well, I'm I'm a sad enough that I would probably be happy to have a long lunch with anybody who gave evidence. <laughs> to the inquiry um, or anybody who, who, who had any role in this um, and uh, I mean I suppose one one explanation for it is that um, when you get too many lawyers involved they get too cautious I mean yeah. I work with lawyers in my job um, in terms of libel and defamation cases and um, they are outstanding and um, some of them are, 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 are phenomenal and are able to help us to publish things that otherwise we couldn't publish but I know that for a lot of them their default setting is to be cautious to say mm, that might be problematic and just reading through that report, I get the sense that maybe with lots of lawyers involved in this team, um, potentially they thought it's easier to defend this if it's challenged in a mm -hmm. judicial review by somebody who we're criticising. If we just say it this way, I don't know, but yes, I would love to. I'd love to ask those questions. You'd love to know the answer, even though you could Sorry. never publish them. Yeah. Um, a few, I think the last time you spoke probably was um, in a very strange occasion, probably the the weirdest thing of the year so far. Um, uh, we were sitting in the Stormont Hotel at the front. The um, it was a large group of boiler owners. It was the, it was the Renewable Heat Association yes. um, who were having their fourth AGM, and bless them, they never thought they would get a fourth AGM. They thought this would all be over. You were getting to kind of talk a bit about the book, and they were getting to ask you questions. Uh, there was a lovely moment um, when it was really cold in the room and they asked for the heat to be turned up and I didn't think we were allowed to think it was funny but they thought it was okay. It's cold here now I should say. But well it's, it's my yeah, fault but, the owner of this. But we've got big lights and it's kind of warming it up. Um, but do you have some sympathy for their kind of their plea in a sense is that they were in many ways honest brokers and all of this they were trapped by so some of them were farmers with contracts with poultry producers or kind of um, food producers and um, they had to provide stuff that seemed to be the most sensible way to do it they took out loans with banks and um, for equipment that they can barely kind of pay off now and they feel kind of pretty hard done by and um, it's clear in their you know they're not a happy bunch um, and, and they are, their well-being um, you know you would kind of worry about um, do you have a kind of a sympathy that actually at the beginning they were kind of made out to be possibly kind of barn doors open radiators on the outside heating the world and it turns out that actually yeah, it's more complicated than that. It's much more complicated than that. Anybody who's read the book will will know that I that I've got some sympathy for these people, um, significant sympathy for these people. I do not have sympathy for their argument, which is their legal argument at the minute that we should go back to burn to earn. Um, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to overturn the um, changes to the regulations that retrospectively cut what they got. So whereas Arlene Foster and her official said to these people, twenty years unlimited um, in, in, in terms of the length of time that you can run your boiler and the only way is up so your payments will only ever go up with inflation they can never be cut they are legally unchallengeable effectively they they, they call it grandfathering it's a it's a legal term which basically means you, you, you really can't even legislate in the future to change what is there and so they were given the firmest guarantee they could get 
I've talked to some of these people about how they went into their banks and in some cases they thought that their bank was going to say to them where's the um, what what is the level of security that you're going to have to put up for this and they were going to have a have a, have a um, complex negotiation with the bank as to what security they would have to put up and the bank said no there's no need for security we've got a letter from the minister what more security could we have I mean this is a cast iron guarantee mm -hmm. from the top of government and so I have enormous sympathy for some of these people. They have seen their payments cut from a notional £56,000 a year if they ran the boiler around the clock. Um, very few of them could do that. And if they did it, it wouldn't last for very long. But um, some of them were running it for 60, 70, 80, 90% of the year. Um, they were getting very large payments. Some of those people now privately are very candid that this was an incredibly lucrative scheme. They were getting a lot of money. They accept that it shouldn't go back to that. But they, they are, I think, legitimately making the argument that what it has been cut to now is derisory in comparison to what is in the rest of the UK and in terms of what's in the, the rest of the island of Ireland in terms of the uh, Irish Republic. And so therefore, there is a massive problem here. These people trusted their government. They invested because their government said they wanted them to do that and they have the rug pulled out from under them. And when I talk to civil servants at Stormont um, in briefings and in other settings um, who are involved now in setting these tariffs, I'm not convinced that they have really um, got on top of this, that they really have learned the lessons of this. There is still a deep scepticism of these people. I think that's understandable. And some of these people are crooks and they ought to be out of the scheme. And one of the failures of Stormont is to even audit all of these people. They yes. still haven't been round all the boilers. They still can't even prove that all these boilers exi actually exist in situ. Um, but I think some of these people have been, have been treated disgracefully. Um, they're now an awkward um, difficulty for Stormont, for politicians, for civil servants. Um, and so they need to be treated fairly out of this. It also, uh, the whole scheme has kind of destroyed the credibility of um, environmental schemes, um, environmental energy. We were into solar, we were into wind. Um, this was a great idea. We can kind of grow trees. We can then burn them to, to heat. We can grow more trees. It's, it feels very sustainable um, until you get to the point where you kind of realise that um, you were doing this kind of needlessly and actually kind of causing environmental harm. Yeah. Um, this makes it very difficult to have other schemes in the future that are actually legitimate and well thought out and have small incentives to get people on board. Which is a massive problem. I mean, these schemes are going to be with us for the rest of our lives. Um, this is the way that um, that energy is moving, that, that, that government is moving to try to incentivise us to uh, do this. And somebody like Dr John Barry at the, the School of Politics at Queen's University and an ardent um, uh, environmentalist, former, member, former um, councillor for the Green Party, has spoken very powerfully, I think, about the significance of this on the environment, that at a point where we need to be moving towards these schemes, Northern Ireland is so far behind and it's going to be so difficult to convince the public and one of the difficulties is that the argument that Stormont makes to justify the fact that they have cut the tariffs so low in comparison to even the rest of the UK is to say that EU state aid law means that we can't do anything more generous than this and yet if Stormont doesn't do something much more generous than where they're at at the moment um, they will not be able to convince people to get on board because who on earth would believe Stormont if they promised them the earth at this point so there's a massive difficulty of trust there. Um, kind of finally, as we come to a close, um, you probably didn't think kind of four or five years ago that you would write a book. You may have thought as a journalist, maybe one day there'll be a big story and I'll write a book, but you probably didn't see kind of our age. It was going to be it. Um, and promoting it and talking about it has taken up lots of your time. Um, your family haven't seen so much of you. Um, you've been kind of holed up writing as well. Um, uh, what do you kind of what do you hope for in the future? Do you are you kind of looking for the next story that will kind of be like this? Probably for Northern Ireland's sake, you shouldn't. But um, there be more, or do you think actually um, will the pandemic actually kind of keep you as a journalist probably pretty busy for the next while, just trying to understand what's happening and explain to people and reassure them of what good government is doing and what bad government should stop doing. Yeah. Well, for now, it's the only thing that matters, and it's and it's what all of us, whatever our line of work, are uh, thinking of and grappling with. Um, for for now as well, it means that I'm seeing a lot more of my family, of course, as are as are most of us. Um, which Your is, whole a, paper which is, is a good thing. Yeah, everybody is working from home and producing Absolutely. paper still. That's Absolutely. Um, I think though, I mean, what I what I want to see is um, not not so much the next story. And actually, one of the difficulties of this is that I've got all sorts of people phoning me and emailing me and sending me messages saying you should write a book about this. I'm, I'm not in a position to write a book for quite some time, <laughs> given how um, long-suffering my family have been towards me. But um, I, I, I'm a citizen here. I've got a family. They, they, they use the school system. Um, I have got a wife who works in the public sector. Um, I've got friends who live here. This is my home, like, like all of us. I want to see better government. I want to see um, Stormont improve. I want to see people genuinely learn the lessons of this. There's some evidence that that is happening, both in politics and in the civil service. I'm not sure it's gone far enough yet. Um, and so one of the things for me, I suppose, as a journalist is to try to actually probe this and ask the awkward questions. 
but I, I want to see things better. I don't want to have to write about another RHI because I hope it doesn't actually happen. Sam McBride, thank you very much.